examined everyone here. And one of us is infected. It's quiet. It was our cutting-edge MRI that finally revealed it. But we don't know what language strain it is. Get back to base. Time for her to talk. You know the room number. 101. Anything? Still living up to her name. How about you drop the act? Who infected you with a parasite? We can't let her talk. Put it back. All I want's a name. That won't trigger anything. Tell me. Tell me! Your lungs have been barbecued. This traces of rubbing alcohol in your alveoli. This was found adhered to your lungs, intact. A petal, white star of Bethlehem. The hospital. Skullface sent you to Cyprus to kill Snake. You were burned inside and out. That should have been the end of it. But, all things considered, you look pretty damn healthy to me. We have Skullface to thank for that, right? I was the only one capable of applying them to parasite therapy until he stole them from me. Why are you here? Did Skullface send you? Or did you have your own score to settle with the boss? <laughs> Refreshing? Salt water. No! She'll die! His life isn't yours to take. Enough. That's enough. If she wanted to kill the boss, he'd already be dead. Same goes for us. She's had plenty of chances. She can't talk. She's not here to kill anyone. I'm wasting your time. It doesn't matter why she's here. She works for you now. She's in love with the legend. What makes you so sure? I was the same way once. What if she's a spy? What if I'm a spy? Are you? 
Go on all day. Boss. Let her go. She won't speak, so she can't spread the infection. <laughs> Oh, Idiki Black Anat, eh? Oh, Ako Kode, she's destiny. The death is odd. Belagana Gisnita Tato be yasteta Ase tota Toto nista Toto nista. List. We've received some new job offers. The details are on your iDroid. Boss, some of the kids we've been keeping here have escaped. We don't know why they ran off, but it may have something to do with Ralph's death. The intel teams are looking for them as we speak. I'll add information to your side ops list as it comes in. We need to locate and secure those kids. I'll try to find out what happened. Specify a project. Please select a mission. Unit dispatched. Unit dispatched. Unit dispatched. Unit dispatched. Please select a mission. I have no doubt Skullface's plan is almost complete. At that point, 
point. I will no longer be of use to him. I must leave behind this record at least. A record of how the ancient vocal cord parasites became these abominable ethnic cleansing parasites. I believe he has two purposes for the ethnic cleansing parasites. The first, as their name suggests, is ethnic cleansing. This conflict between East and West that envelops the world will not last much longer. Once the Cold War ends, and the weight of America and the Soviet Union is lifted away, the ethnic conflicts they kept suppressed will all rise to the surface. It is not difficult to imagine that the radical sides will begin cleansing their adversaries. But what if an ethnic cleansing parasite matching the language of the aggressors were to be unleashed? The aggressors would be washed off the earth. At the very least, the idea that retaliation could eradicate your people would prove a powerful deterrent. The second purpose is the Englishization of the world. To cipher the organization, this is probably their main use. Man thinks in words, or rather, words are man's very means of thinking. If you erase a word representing some concept, the concept itself disappears from the world. Nishone means beautiful in Navajo. But the image that comes to mind when we say Nishone differs from the Blagana's beautiful. An azure sky, a rolling landscape, lush greenery. The meaning we place in Nejone has its roots in Diné culture. If we lose the word Nejone, the images of our beautiful homeland would be washed away into oblivion along with it. Just as Orwell indicated years ago, Cypher, being based in America, is pushing Englishization for this very reason. Suppose all five billion people on this planet come to read, speak, and think in English. Their wills could also be streamlined under English. Cypher's control would be all the easier. Economic governance would progress in leaps and bounds. The ethnic cleansing parasites would be a great aid in accomplishing this goal. There is no need to destroy every language besides English. All they need to do is weaken other dominant languages competing with it. Russian, Chinese, Arabic. If people know they risk their lives speaking such languages, they will flock to the lingua franca that is English. Cypher need not even focus attention on smaller languages. After all, they are already being eaten away by English. Business, education, film, commodities. English has permeated every area of global society. I can see this when I look at young Diné. Some of them have already lost their grasp of the Navajo language. It is said that over 2,000 languages of the world are facing extinction. This very moment, cultural concepts and forms of expression are disappearing forever. The spread of electronic networks gives greater meaning to Englishization. Networks have no national borders, but basing them on a single language, they can penetrate deeper into and between people. That basic point of unity provides the ideal environment for someone who aims to control people's wills. But how does this differ from building the Tower of Babel? The ethnic cleansing parasites attempt to rob man of his words. Such irony. It was the vocal cord parasites that gave words to him in the first place. Ancient man had no language. Unable to produce complex sounds due to the structure of the throat, 
he could communicate only through simple vocalizations and gestures. Then the vocal cord parasites infected his larynx. Man's transition to walking upright did not gift him solely with intelligence, but also with his voice. At the time, the vocal cord parasites never harmed man. They merely took a small measure of nourishment. In fact, you could call it a symbiotic relationship. Some animal species use particular vocalization patterns to attract a female and reproduce. Songbirds, certain insects, and also the vocal cord parasites. The difference is that the parasites themselves did not produce sounds. Rather, they had their hosts, man, do it for them. Once secure on the human host vocal cords, a male vocal cord parasite caused the host to produce a certain sound pattern, something like a warble of a bird. Meanwhile, females parasitizing other host pharynxes need only wait upon hearing the sound pattern of an attractive mate. They would manipulate their hosts into making contact with the person it came from. The female traveled through his host's saliva to the other host's vocal cords where the male was waiting and the pair copulated. We can only imagine how the female manipulated his host, but it was probably through smell. Smells traveled directly to the limbic system via the olfactory cilia in the nasal cavity. Volatile compounds released by the female would stimulate the limbic system, which controls instincts, making the host feel amorous. This kind of sexual selection naturally led to competition between the male parasites. Males that had their hosts produce sounds perceived by females as more attractive succeeded in copulating and producing offspring. Evolutionary traits caused by sexual selection are curious. The peacock's feathers, the mannequin's dance, the firefly's luminescence pattern. Even with courtship behaviors that are not advantageous to survival, those individuals that excel in them produce offspring, and it escalates with each generation. The same was true of the vocal cord parasites. Courtship vocalization rhythms and intonations became more sophisticated, and in order for man to produce such sounds, they had to alter his vocal organs. By lowering the position of the larynx and developing resonating chambers, they enabled more complex pronunciations. But that was not all. The vocal cord parasites activated a transcription factor that would later control man's language ability. A protein that due to its appearance is called 4 kid box protein P2 or Fox P2. Activating this transcription factor led to the development of brain function capable of creating sophisticated frequency changes. This was the pinnacle of the vocal cord parasite's prosperity. However, this sophisticated pronunciation control was too useful for man to ignore. Once human sexual activity ceased to be only seasonal, and having lost pigment-based sexual characteristics, distinctive vocalizations became the most effective means for humans to attract mates as well. Combined with logic pathways hardwired into the brain, or universal grammar, it was not long before advanced communication was possible. This was the birth of language. Luckily for man, it was around this time that a particular retrovirus was circulating. While not lethal, it infected not only man, but the vocal cord parasites as well. It is presumed that this virus removed part of the parasite's DNA and reverse transcribed it into man's reproductive cells. It was a vector. 
among the genes it transcribed were the ones responsible for the production of language. The vocal cord parasites vocalization genes were written into the human genome. The parasites were no longer of any use to man now. Man could use his voice as he pleased when he pleased, hindering the parasite's courtship vocalizations. Having lost their opportunity to reproduce, the parasites died out, leaving behind only the transcribed genes. The vocal cord parasites were once in symbiosis with man. Its genes even became a part of his. Humans and parasites are extremely close. As such, it will be extremely difficult for man's immune system to eliminate the vocal cord parasites. Even cutting them out will be no simple matter, which is exactly why these ethnic cleansing parasites are such a formidable weapon. The rise of the vocal cord parasites goes back approximately 300 million years to the Permian period. At that time, they were not even parasites, but predatory autotrophs. They are believed to have been the common ancestor to the Pentastomida and the Cyclops genus of copepods. However, Earth's environment underwent a violent change at the end of the Permian period. The cause is unclear, but evidence suggests that over 90% of the Earth's organisms at that time died out. The most pronounced threat to the protoparasites was the severe reduction in oxygen concentration. The result was cladogenesis a splitting that gave birth to a new strain that could parasitize other organisms' respiratory apparatus. This survival tactic helped lower their oxygen consumption, and inhabiting the throat kept them securely in contact with inhaled air. The survivors were those that parasitized the reptiles that flourished at the time. Entering the Triassic period, the reptiles evolved into dinosaurs, and the protoparasites shared in their success. Dinosaurs developed respiratory organs called air sacs to adapt to the low oxygen environment. These in particular helped the protoparasites thrive. But another trial awaited them. The end of the Triassic period saw another drastic change in the Earth's environment. For most parasites, the male and female take the same host. Many are, in fact, hermaphrodites. Originally, the vocal cord parasites were as well. But for any strain to ride out a severe environmental change, it must secure a steady pool of genetic diversity. Another split. Now the newest strain procreated with mates found in other hosts and in order to increase its encounters with those mates, the new strain utilized the voice of its host. They came to inhabit the host's vocal cords. This truly was the birth of the vocal cord parasite. The parasites developed the host's pharynx to form resonating chambers and used them to produce sophisticated mating calls. The relatively upright posture of the dinosaurs was important in this because the crooked L-shaped pharynx was more suited to the development of resonating chambers. These developments ushered in a time of great prosperity for the parasites. But for the third time, the parasites had a major hurdle to overcome. The meteorite impact at the end of the Cretaceous period which spelled the end of the dinosaurs. With their hosts extinct, the vocal cord parasites had no option but to find a new habitat. Birds. As genetic successors to the dinosaurs with functioning air sac apparatus already in place, birds were the perfect choice. But the parasites could not survive in birds that flew at high altitudes with thinner air. 
so they parasitized ground-dwelling birds and altered their respiratory system for the sake of reproduction. They gave the birds the means to produce sophisticated sounds, the syrinx responsible for chirping. This is the proof that points to activation of Fox P2 in songbirds as well as humans. The Cenozoic era began with a rise in oxygen concentration, which helped mammals to evolve and increase in size. The parasites then shifted to humans as a more effective host. Humans' bipedal upright walking meant that our throats could support larger resonating chambers. At first, vocal cord parasites entered humans using birds as their intermediate host. But eventually, they changed to conducting their entire life cycle within human hosts. What happened next is as I have already described. People took the vocalizing prowess given them by the parasites and made it language. And once the parasites could no longer use it as their mating call, they died out. Or in other words, the parasites overcame all evolutionary hurdles except humanity. Skullface shared his opinion on this matter. He said the ethnic cleansers project was sure to succeed. After all, the parasites had a grudge against us humans. To think we awoke them after such a long slumber, just so they could sate their thirst for vengeance. It is terrible. Unforgivable. And yet, it is what I have done. I learned of the vocal cord parasite's existence in literature belonging to the Foundation. It was little more than a theory. The question was, why does only Homo sapiens among all primates have highly developed language? Human versus everything else. The missing link between these was the mystery that gave rise to this theory. I was fascinated by the idea of their existence. In the Dine creation myth, the Neyo Dine, who first inhabited the world, were insect-like creatures. I came to imagine that those insect-like creatures could be humans living in symbiosis with the vocal cord parasites but I had not the faintest idea of how I could resurrect them. That is when Skullface came to me. What he offered me was not just assistance with my metallic archaea research. He told me the vocal cord parasites really existed. And not only did they exist, they had already been brought back to life in the modern age. An ancient human cadaver host to the parasites of the time. Cypher excavated such a cadaver from a permafrost region and isolated the DNA coding of the vocal cord parasites. Naturally, they were long dead and could not be brought back, but there was an alternate oh, vessel they could so use. Good. A relative species of the Pendastomida discovered in China. It had adapted to live in the nasal cavity of animal hosts. But its genetic sequence showed signs of common ancestry with the vocal cord parasites. Ontogenesis, a path of an organism to maturity, is like a roadmap of the phylogenetic evolution of the entire strain. Cypher used this to effect a reverse evolution of the modern parasite and resurrect the vocal cord parasites. They interpose a developmental mechanism to the ontogenetic stage analogous to when the relative species first appeared, the point at which it split from the vocal cord parasites, forcing its evolution down the other path, the vocal cord parasite path. The larvae is produced by the vocal cord parasites Reborn. I do not know in detail how Cypher accomplished this, but clearly they have access to higher level genetic technologies.
Skullface said it was the work of a genius woman scientist, and that the relative species in question was first discovered by a group once called the Philosophers. I was tasked with modifying the resurrected parasites. He charged me with two demands. First, to add lethality to these organisms that had once lived in peace with man by unleashing the larvae's latent desire to consume nutrients from the host's lung tissue, making them eat and eat until the lungs were destroyed. Second, to have both male and female inhabit the same host and copulate then and there only when exposed to specific pronunciations continuously over an extended time. What he would do to the Diné if I failed. I had no choice. Originally, the ultimate objective of the ethnic cleansing parasite project was the identification of not only languages, but of actual cultures. Language is deeply connected to ethnicity. But many languages are employed by multiple ethnic groups, and confrontation between those ethnic groups is by no means rare. If the cleanser parasites were to be a deterrent against ethnic conflict, they had to distinguish between groups using means other than pure language. The original plan called for this to be achieved by differences in the transmission vector. Each ethnic group has different lifestyle customs and eating habits. For instance, parasites living in shallow water and taken in through the skin could be used to target rice farming groups, or parasites using cows as their intermediate host would be ineffective against cultures that abstain from eating beef. But that is a lofty goal indeed. The current parasites mainly rely on droplet transmission. It would take extensive time to alter the transmission route. I eventually learned that the ethnic cleansers project had been shut down. It was Skullface who put it back into operation. But despite that, he told me to forget about the transmission route and just focus on language identification. I do not know why. I understand that the Chinese philosophers who discovered the relative species of parasite originally planned to develop a phonogrammic Alexia parasite. The left temporal parietal region is home to the part of the brain that identifies the phonetic symbols of the English language. They wished to create a strain that would parasitize that region and suppress its literacy functions. The brain area responsible for identifying the logographs of Chinese, meanwhile, is in the left middle frontal gyrus, meaning that even if native speakers of Chinese were infected with the parasite, their literacy would be unaffected. Old and new, east and west, there is no limit to the delusions of those in power. But this delusion threatens to become a reality. I have to do something to stop this. There must be something I can do.